Hi, good afternoon. Happy to be with you. Uh, my name is Fred Goldstein. I'm with the NRIL Consulting Group, and I've been uh, working in the telecom industry for many years. My specialty is the intersection of regulation, technology, and business. And I've been following FCC telecom activities for a long time and following the technology. So there's a lot of, and also I'm a history buff in this area. So we can talk about where it's going and see how uh, where it's going in the future relates to how it's happened in the past. First off, the public switch telephone network really is more than analog pots. Speak right closer. Okay. The network goes back about 140 years when there were cord switchboards beginning in the 1870s. And so for about the first century, it was dominated by plain old telephone service, pots. It was a monopoly service, but it was a reliable way to carry voice. Another feature of the monopoly was that the price had no relationship to the cost. They had counting systems that were designed to cover the cost, and the pricing was entirely political. And there were limited options. It happens in a monopoly. Today's technology has created many ways to talk at a distance. That's what telephone means, a distant talk. Are they still the PSTN? Many of them, not all, still are. What is it that defines the PSTN? When we say PSTN, what exactly is the PSTN? Well, it has a regulated public utility background. The service providers were historically licensed common carriers. They had regulated wholesale prices and still have sometimes regulated retail prices. They used to always be regulated. They had tariffs or price supervision. A principle of the PSTN, universal service, one network with multiple providers. It's not an internet, it's a catanet, and there's a difference. Common carriage means the payload is sacrosanct. The network can't care about what you say, they don't get a cut of the action based on the value of your speech. Interconnection is mandatory. Everyone can call almost everyone else worldwide. There are exceptions, but they're not the general rule. A carrier must accept traffic from other carriers. They must deliver the traffic to other carriers. The rate is subject to regulation for the interconnection between carriers to prevent gouging. Because if it weren't regulated and I have to give you the call, fine, give me a dollar a minute. You have to give me the call. No, not allowed to do that. The government regulated namespace. Telephone numbers are a name. They started off as an address space, now they're a name space. But the government owns it. What is not the definition of the PSTN? Well, it's changed in a lot of ways since 1876. So there are a lot of things that aren't definitional. The protocols, human or machine mediated, it was operators, humans, running the network for the first 50 years in the Bell case and even later in some locations. The transmission technology has changed. The switching technology has changed. It's gone back and forth between monopoly and competition multiple times. It went from electromechanical to computer control. It's gone from all fixed to largely mobile. Those are still PSTN. And another thing about the PSTN is that they have backwards compatibility. The current generation and the previous generation, they overlap. Insulated wires, pointing out one of the big improvements around the beginning of the 20th century, instead of having all those wires separate from each other on cross arms, building big bundled insulated cables is a big deal technologically. A lot has changed lately. The internet itself, which is not the PSTN, is more important to commerce and many individuals than the PSTN, but they are complementary. If your house were on fire, would you call 911 or send an email? The PSTN is designed for quick, reliable connections. The internet is catch as catch can. Non-PSTN voice applications do operate on the internet. They are an alternative. Skype, FaceTime, Blackberry Messenger. Users carry on many conversations without using the PSTN. The PSTN providers have alienated them. Why do people go to these other applications? Why do people Skype rather than make a phone call? Well, mobile PSTN is as big in terms of residential minutes of use and even business to some extent as the fixed PSTN. It's very popular. It's still the PSTN. 
why it's not popular. Maybe the PS10 is controlled by idiots. Think about monopoly DNA. The PSTN is dominated by providers who started as monopolies. They think monopoly. They barely tolerate competition. And for the most part, where there's regulation, the regulation's captive. They don't think they have to be competitive. And they hate the internet. They never liked the internet. It broke their business model. The business model of the PSTN always had local, long distance. They charged for distance. The internet took away the profit, which was from distance. So they really hated it. And they still do, even though they pay lip service to it. The two biggest US carriers, AT&T, the faux AT&T, it's really Southwestern Bell that bought the rest, and Verizon, which is really Bell Atlantic, they care about mobile. That's where their money is going, their investment. They're not doing much with their fixed networks to trying to shut them down. Regulation is captive. The states have passed laws. Our friends at ALEC put a model legislation in, many states have passed, to free the incumbent telephone companies from state regulation of rates or service. They start with the assumption that it's so competitive it doesn't need to be regulated. Then they stamp out the competition. Some regulators just don't care, even though they have authority. And the FCC's had this attitude for the past 15 years that some future technology will always fix things. That even if there's not any real competition now, you know, maybe, anyone remember broadband over power line? They actually use that as an excuse to deregulate access to fiber. Because after all, there'll be BPL as a a new provider. I really think their model is that subspace communication, you know, in Star Trek communicators is going to come along and be the ultimate competition and therefore we don't need to regulate those pesky old copper wires that still have a monopoly of access to most homes. The short-term victories against competition that they've won in the past dozen, 15 years to shut down competitive voice providers in many cases, shut down competitive internet providers in many cases, may have led to long-term losses. It was a short-term thinking. Now, another feature of the PSTN, the whole regulatory model, I mentioned they don't like the internet because it broke their long-distance model. But this goes back to 1929. There was a Supreme Court case, Smith versus Illinois Bell, and it defined the local telephone network as being partially interstate jurisdiction. The FCC, well, it was in those days, it wasn't the FCC. Long distance, you know a dollar a minute was worth, in today's terms, a dollar a minute in 1929? But for a businessman making a big deal, you know, all Chicago to New York, pay whatever it costs in order to finish a deal. Have you ever watched Boardwalk Empire? When Nucky, this is the 1920s, and Nucky would pick up the phone and call Cuba? You know, that was possible, but it was not something anyone with less resources than Nucky could have done, right? And so as long as you're only dealing with rich folks, Smith was the attorney general of Illinois and a populist. And so he wanted to lower phone rates by putting part of the bill onto the federal jurisdiction so that long distance would cover part of the cost of local service. That was a great consumer victory in 1929 but now that tail wags the dog. Regulation has been based on subsidizing local box lines from long distance revenues. Well, then along came mobile phones. You can't locate, are they local or not? So they're not subject to the same charges. 1996, they changed the rules for mobile. Well, of course, in 1996, mobile was again a rare luxury, you know, very small impact. Wire line will still continue to pay. Well, now what we've got is that most people are using mobile because it's not subject to those rules. And so the tiny percentage of people who still use POTS lines are being gouged because those long distance calls, and that can be two towns away, are treated as a luxury still, paying the tax to support the basic rate, which is why people have gone to use, cut the cord all mobile because they don't get gouged on it. Why do we continue this? The Bell companies don't get that money. The rural phone companies, in the US, it's about 2% of the total business. The rural phone companies still depend on long distance. They're called switch access charges. The minutes of use a long distance company pays to deliver a call to them. And so all the rules are still based on keeping them alive on that basis. Being phased out, 
largely phased down from where it was, but the structure is still in place to worry about what's local, what's long distance. Let's look at monopoly. We assume, well, it was a monopoly before the Telecom Act, now it's supposed to be competitive. The PSTN was competitive starting in 1893. Bell patented the telephone in 1876, had 17 years of monopoly, but in 1893 it opened up and independent telephone companies happened. Bell, though, did control long distance. The loading coil, they bought the patent on the loading coil, which let the phone work well between five and 50 miles. And then they had additional patents along the years. They've always been strong in patents to protect their monopolies. The Kingsbury Commitment was a deal made with the Assistant Attorney General Kingsbury in 1912 that said, well, instead of having real competition, we'll allow the independent telephone companies to connect to our long distance network so they can make toll calls, not local, but toll calls across our network and in exchange, we will not buy them up unless they go bankrupt. So we ended up with this structure of a patchwork of phone companies. So you had the bells in the cities and the independent phone companies in the country where the profit margins were lower. And so most of the countryside and some smaller markets, Lincoln, Nebraska, Rochester, New York, were non-bell markets, but almost all the big cities were bell markets. The, by 1934, the remaining competition had all gone out of business. So it allowed a de jure monopoly. It assumed the telephone industry was a monopoly. Regulated rates. And they regulated, the monopoly was on everything. The telephone handset, remember you had to rent your phone, you couldn't have a modem without, a 103 modem, 300 bits per second. Anyone remember what that rented for in 1968? Standard bill, huh? $90 a month. I think it was 25 for the model 103. But the, the higher speed modems were like, would be 90 a month. So ju just to have, there may be an exception in some states though. Acoustic couple. Well, those weren't acoustic. Those were actually direct plug-in. But acoustic couplers um, were not, well, they, they, they did exist. Some, one of the Bell companies decided to challenge acoustic couplers. In 1968, they lost the case. Carter phone was, the Carter phone device was an acoustic coupler. Not for data, for offshore radio offshore radio and telephone interface, acoustic. And the FCC ruled that that was OK, and that, in fact, other terminal devices could be attached to the network that it shouldn't be a monopoly anymore. They cried in their beer, grandma would not be able to afford a phone if they couldn't make the monopoly profits renting luxury items like princess phones, telephones that were not black, Answering machines, which they Bell paid $400 for and rented for many dollars a month, mostly to movie theaters to play the uh, recorded announcements. Didn't have answering machines at home because Bell companies didn't you know, rent them cheaply. So they cried in their beer when answering machines came out because now the call completion rate went up. Someone dialed a long distance call, no one's home. The answering machine answered. They got their money for the call. They didn't want that to happen. They cried all the way to the bank. That's very much the history of the telephone industry, crying all the way to the bank. In 1969, the MCI decision opened a private line competition that Microwave Communications Incorporated built a microwave network from Chicago to St. Louis and wanted to rent it to people. And the Bell system said, oh, no, you can't rent that. We have a monopoly. The FCC said, no, private lines can be competitive. And that expanded, too, into long distance. The modified final judgment, which was called divestiture, in 1984 took effect, broke up Ma Bell into AT&T, the competitive long distance and equipment company, and the seven regional Bell operating companies that were the local telephone monopolies. The assumption was these poor little baby bells needed protection because all the money was in long distance. But the structure was that the monopoly was able to charge minutes of use to all the long distance companies and gouge monopoly profits out of them. So the bells cried all the way to the bank. MCI is dead. It's owned by, it's, its assets were acquired in bankruptcy by Bell Atlantic, named itself Verizon. AT&T is dead. Its assets acquired by Southwestern Bell, which decided to use the AT&T brand name, right? Sprint still carries on as a separate company, but it's mostly mobile. So 
big changes that was supposed to have monopoly in local in 1984, long distance was deemed naturally competitive. In 1996, local was deemed competitive too. It broke up the de jure local monopoly. States would not authorize local telephone competition. Some did, New York did, Massachusetts had just begun to do so. But Telecom Act opened up local competition. Cable companies have been the major beneficiaries. They had their own wires. Telecom Act says the Bells are supposed to rent their wires to competitors, but between 2001 and 2005, the FCC whittled away all the rules that the previous five years had been passed. So it's very hard to compete with the Bell Company using any of their own facilities. There are all sorts of anti-competitive rules uh, to protect that the Bells have now to protect their assets because they claim it's all so competitive. And in a few locations, mostly high-rise office buildings in New York City, it is. Let's go back to the 1960s. How do computers relate to the phone network? The computer inquiries were a series of rulings by the FCC. These are what permit the internet to exist. Does anyone think the internet as we know it as a public service would have been allowed if the FCC had to go through their rulemaking process? Anyone know how long the FCC's rulemaking process takes? <laughs> they opened up a docket to, de to determine what is voice over IP. In 1996, they still have not decided. They opened a docket to look at switched access, special access rates, private line rates, opened that under court order in 2005, issued their first ruling a couple of months ago. Haven't released new rates, issued a ruling saying, oh, those rates that have been in place for the past 11 years are illegal after all. We'll have to think about what to do about that over the next few years. And of course, the telephone monopolies are crying in their beer and saying, oh, we're being killed by competition. They're making so much monopoly profit there. It's huge, the monopoly profit they're making. The computer inquiries were a way to say, computers, this is 1966, computers will attach to the phone network. Will they be in the network? The one ESS computer controlled switch had just come out. Will people attach to the network? Modems existed already. So where do you draw the line as to how do computers become part of the network versus computers not part of the network? Payload or carriage itself? The com they didn't have a clean answer in computer one, but in 1980, the computer two ruling was a nice clear answer. It was more important than divestiture. The impact of computer two is People don't realize it was more important. It revolutionized the market in the US. Later on, the rest of the world followed our lead. And the FCC repealed it in 2005. The computer two rule said that terminal equipment, that means phones, PBXs, modems, equipment that plugs into the jack must not be part of the tariff. A local phone company could not rent you the equipment. AT&T owned the local phone companies. They could only rent it through a fully separate subsidiary. And because divestiture hadn't happened yet, AT&T created a subsidiary on paper called American Bell Incorporated. Anyone remember American Bell Inc.? Yeah. It lasted for one year, 1983. Because Computer 2 took effect in 1983 and divestiture was 1984. So ABI existed for a year. And they defined in Computer 2 a very critical distinction, something called basic service, that's raw telecommunications, moving the bits unchanged. Enhanced service is the stuff done in the payload. And the Bell companies were barred from offering enhanced services except through a fully separate subsidiary. So anyone could attach the same terms that the Bell's own subsidiary could attach. Online data services took advantage of this. Modems could attach. They were enhanced services. They didn't have to pay long distance access charges, which voice long distance had to pay. That was the point of computer too, people don't realize, to draw a line between the long distance competition had only been authorized officially one year earlier. 1979, final, the NFIRE rulings created switched access. They didn't want to lose that to people plugging in long distance companies. So the rule for computer two was, well, if it's voice, it's basic, it's long distance call. If it's a computer protocol, anything, it's enhanced, not a long distance call. That was the whole point. And 
that's still jumbled. No one remembers that, and that's why we have all this talk. Oh, VoIP isn't head. Bull effing you know what. If it's just playing long distance using VoIP, the bells are using that as an excuse. We'll get to that. It's basic. The 1987 modem tax. Anyone remember that when the FCC proposed, oh, well, the, the, the online service industry's grown up. They can afford to pay access charges, a nickel a minute to use a modem. That was the plan. Got turned down, lots of congressional pressure. Congress and Markey led the charge. They evolved, the online services evolved into ISPs. It wasn't that ISPs popped up. AOL and you know, Prodigy and others, they started offering email, internet email. They started offering Usenet. They started offering web access. They morphed application by application over the 1990s until they became ISPs. The Bells always hated this, but common carriage rules require them to allow it. They don't control the payload. Since 2000, the actual wireline PSTN has been pricing itself out of business. The penetration of POTS goes down, fewer using POTS, more using mobile. So what do they do? They raise the prices. Did you learn that in retailing? Well, people stop buying it, raise the price, right? Well, only if you're a utility or the phone company. Well, if the price goes up, people go away and it's a death spiral. They cut the cord. Ilex don't understand basic pricing, they think they're entitled to revenue. How much money do we want to make? Divide by the remaining number of customers, set the price. VoIP and mobile are both getting regulatory breaks. They don't pay the access charges that POTS does. The Bells, however, are making huge money. Most of their revenue comes now from special access. These are now under the new name the FCC adopted two months ago or so, Business Data Services, BDS. There's something kinky that reminds me of. <laughs> Most of that is backhaul to the cell towers because cellular is wireless for the last thousand feet, right? Depending where you are, it could be a couple of miles. But it's a wired network with a very long cordless cord. Cellular is still based on wire and it's fiber nowadays, most cases, and the, be well, many cases still copper to smaller cells, and it's still monopoly priced. They gouge the smaller cell codes, right? The Verizon does one deal for Verizon Wireless and another deal for Sprint. They, they cross-subsidize their affiliates that way. Verizon Core, the, the wireline company, installs fiber dedicated to its own wireless. They will not do for T-Mobile or Sprint, or AT, even AT&T. Although with AT&T, I always think Verizon and AT&T have a little back scratching in their own territories. Data circuits used by businesses and ISPs are part of BDS. So this is the money. And the revenue, because many of these have been deregulated, the FCC 10 years ago said, oh, you don't have to tariff these anymore. Just they're unregulated. Uh, there's so much competition. The market will take care of it. So the revenue doesn't even show up on their books. They go to the state regulators, oh, we're losing money. They go to the Wall Street investor, oh, we're making great money. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. The public switch telephone network does continue unabated as a wholesale service to interconnect all the carriers. It carries billions of calls. The tandem network of tandem switches interconnects the wireline and wireless carriers. Those have been modernized in recent years. They do support VoIP. The newer ones, not that they'll let a competitor use it, but they do support it. There's uh, modern switches like Sonus Networks replacing the old 4 ESSs, which are gone. Interconnected voice provi VoIP providers have to buy their access from a CLEC, which is a competitive local exchange carrier, is a true PSTN carrier. They interconnect by the rules. They go to each other. They connect to the tandems. Problem is that the long distance business uses least cost routing. There are many long distance companies. And they quote prices to every destination. So they go to the cheapest one. But they're actually forming routing loops because they're, each one's bought, he's the cheapest to there, he's the cheapest to the different contracts, and the call never gets through. This has been a problem. I've uh, worked with some rural carriers, so they discover they literally can't get through, and you have to convince somebody to change the routing. The internet itself does not carry much PSTN. For all the talk of VoIP, it's not the internet. True VoIP is not much traffic. Maybe 6% of voice calls go over the internet because the quality is inadequate. 
okay, bad quality. The internet was designed to be the non-PSTN. We had a PSTN. The internet was optimized for non-streaming data services. What does it offer? The only service the internet offers is called best efforts, scare quotes required. Right? It's not the best efforts. Best means best. But in the internet world, best means the lowest class of service. Oh, it's just best efforts. Tell a lawyer, oh, I'm just going to make a contract for best efforts. If I don't you know, deliver, it's okay, because it's just best efforts. In contract law, best means best. And so they have this thing I call BESQR service. IP transport is the bottom quality, not really good for voice. It works sometimes. It's not always. Let's look at the evolution, though. The PSTN always evolved. IP is an evolutionary change, right? 1876, Elisha Gray invented the, right? Invented the phone. <laughs> oh, you thought Alexander Graham Bell invented it? Have you hugged your patent lawyer today? <laughs> Bell's phone didn't work. Gray invented the microphone. Bell's phone, you shouted into the earpiece, okay? And it worked from downstairs to upstairs in his lab in Scully Square in Boston. Of course, you could hear him up the stairway. Gray invented the carbon microphone, and that's what went into production. But Bell bribed, Bell's patent lawyer bribed the patent examiner to sign the patent. In 1893, Almond B. Strouger invented the dial, automatic dial, so it didn't have to go through a cord switchboard. Bell's patents also expired. Independent telephone companies adopted the dial system. Bell stayed for years manual until the 1920s, with rare exceptions, not invented here. They weren't going to pay for Strouger's patent, and that's the stepper switch, what Strouger invented, right? It would go, the de click, 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 click. Each interruption of the current would move it one notch, and then it would go up or down to find a free path out. There were line finders and selectors and connectors, the three variants on the stepper switch, depending where in the matrix they were. 1906, the vacuum tube amplifier, the triode, was invented. And as amplifiers were deployed and improved, the range of a telephone call increased. Bell had the patent on loading coils, though, from the 1890s until that expired, which had a big importance on metropolitan calls, like 50, 100 miles. In the 1920s, frequency division multiplexing was invented. That means you're like putting radio spectrum onto wire, different, or different channels in the supersonic range. And so that became very important to get more than one call at a time over a physical piece of wire. 1920s, common control electromechanical switching. Instead of the stepper, where the call literally pulse by pulse to the switch, there was a contraption of relays running a matrix of switches. This was like computing. This is like a relay computer to decode the dial pulses and figure out where to send the call. This started off with the panel switch and then the crossbar switches. Wonderful contraptions of relays, a skill that has been lost to the modern world. Nowadays, people write code. Nobody knows how to wire up great contraptions of relays. I think if anyone, this would be the place where we'd find people who would be willing to write. And I could just see a let's build a relay computer would be a fun project for the hope contributors, just for the sake of doing it. <laughs> um, in the 1940s, microwave was invented, really started World War II radar, and then microwave radio in the late 40s to carry telephone calls. In the 1950s, AT&T Long Lines Division built a nationwide microwave network and by the 1960s, a majority of long distance calls, interstate calls, traveled by microwave. This is all done with analog technology, frequency division multiplexing. So there were channel banks. In those days, a channel bank was analog channel, four kilohertz spacing, single sideband audio uh, being sent on multiplexers of multiplexers of multiplexers in an analog hierarchy of very, very carefully tuned. It took a lot of maintenance. Uh, to get these all channels balanced so the levels are right, the crosstalk wasn't there. All these stuck onto a microwave radio system, a precision, expensive, analog microwave radio system. And they'd go about 30 miles on a hop, and these huge antennas, and very complicated Klystron amplifiers. And I checked the specific licenses on these. The power output of these amplifiers, how much power do you think one of those big AT&T microwave links, backbone links put out? You know how much power they could generate in their transmitters? Huh? Watts. Four watts. Yes, when yeah. did they deploy in-band signaling? 
in, uh, I'm, coming to, I'm coming to that. Good. Yeah, the Strouger, 19, 19, 1920s, the Strouger, well, actually, 1890s, the Strouger switch was in band signaling. It was interrupting the DC. Right. In terms of, we'll get to how they did it in FDM. Next, well, that, that, that to get there. Also note, the television networks began in 1948. The FCC said they couldn't build their own networks. They had to pay AT&T monthly rents to build the networks. Private microwave was only authorized in 1959 in an FCC decision called above 890. Microwave began at 890 megahertz. This is a map of the Long Lines network in 1960. They had built this huge nationwide network and there were every 30 miles they had to have a relay station. There is a website, longlines.org, I think, that uh, collects a lot of these old documents. Another t change in technology, embedded computing entering the network. Now, the first digital technology in the network wasn't a computer. It was T-Carrier. T1, it was 1960, it was actually built in the lab. It had pulse code modulation, it was right, turning samples using uh, sampling theory, 8,000 samples per second, turned into an 8-bit number. And it was designed to run 6,000 feet on copper twisted pair. Why 6,000 feet? Loading coils went 6,000 feet. So it fit the architecture of the outside plant. They'd replace a loading coil with an amplifier. And at the end were channel banks, just like frequency division multiplex, only it was the D1 channel bank, and they evolved that to the D4 eventually. In 1965, AT&T introduced the 1ESS electromechanical switch. Oh, wait, you said it was computer? Under computer control, but the path of the call went through read relays. It was partially computerized. The computer was unique. They wanted this thing to have legendary bell system reliability. And to be sure, the telephone network was designed for that famous five nines reliability. And so they used ferrite core memory still. Remember ferrite cores? Ferrite sheet memory for program storage. That was unique. And it had three address spaces. There was P data, U data, and working store were separate memory addresses. Some of you may remember, you know, some, some computer architectures have I space and D space, but there were two different D spaces in telephone switches. 40 year lifetime was just an assumption because phone poles were 40 years, relays were 40 years, and the depreciation schedule they used in those days Every piece of capital investment was called a vintage group. Everything they bought went into this vintage group and was depreciated over 40 years. So they had to build all their equipment around a 40-year design if they wanted to. Computers, they thought, you know, they knew they couldn't do it with general purpose computers. But they did design this as a 40-year lifespan and thought because it was computerized, oh, we can always add whatever features are needed. They just didn't understand that there could be, you know, computers didn't last that long. The interfaces were analog, it was backwards compatible with all the relays, with the steppers, with the crossbars. In the 1970s, more digital switching. The digital central office began in the 1970s. Anyone ever hear of VIDAR, the VIDAR switch? That was a company that built the first digital telephone switch introduced in 1976. Northern Telecom, DMS 10, 1977. AT&T Bell System did not come until the 80s. Digital PBXs for private use came on the market in 1975. Nortel SL1, Rome CBX, and uh, the ha Harris had one. There's several companies had them. AT&T Western Electric digitized the toll network, though. The 4ESS, introduced in 1976, replaced the crossbars that ran the, the, the toll network. The crossbars, by the, there was something called, you know, they're the crossbar tandems, and there was something called the card translator. I don't have one to show you, but the card translator was how you would take, you know, 617529, where does that go? Well, that was punched into a card. The card was a sheet of aluminum about a foot long, and the metal sheets would drop. It had notches in the bottom and holes in it, and the numbers would, the, that you were dialing would cause one sheet to fall, and probes would find the holes and route the call. A metal card translator, so to introduce a new phone prefix, they punched a metal card, drilled and nibbled out a metal card. It was bizarre, but it was, memory. hmm? A read-only memory. Yeah, it was a read-only memory made out of, kind of a, trouble cards, too. Well, the trouble cards were paper. They punch a paper card, I think, a paper. But the card translator used metal 
punch cards. Um, the, so they did away with that in the 4 ESS when they finally went digital with T1 interfaces that didn't need a channel bank. They were huge because this is primitive technology. They were stayed in service until the, the past decade. They're now gone. Ma Bell didn't have local digital, the 5 ESS, until the 1980s, and it has, and they're still in service, thousands of 5 ESSs. They were built to last 40 years, and frankly, they were built like the proverbial brick, you know what, and they do last, but the analog POTS lines plugged into an analog crossbar, because in 1980, the codec, the function of analog to digital conversion looked so expensive, they had to use, invent a type of semiconductor, the gated diode exchange, gated diode cross point, that could interconnect these high voltage 90 volt ringers to these expensive codecs. Now, of course, the codecs are everywhere. It's a bizarre architecture. And there are thousands of these early DMSs and ESSs still in service. But the companies who made them, Nortel is history, Western Electric, which became Lucent, is history. Now they're, you know, uh, Western Electric legacy. Anyone know who now owns the 5 ESS? What company? Nokia. Nokia. Yeah. Of all places, it ended up Nokia. They got Microsoft to buy their losing phone business for more than it was worth, and they bought up the residuary of Siemens and uh, Alcatel, which included Western Electric. Signaling how you send phone numbers down the line has evolved. Trunk signaling was originally dial pulses, click, click, click. How did you send a dial pulse? Well, everything on an analog circuit had to be done via tones. So you had multi-frequency tones came out like in the 50s. The multi-frequency tone generator. The single, frequency. the single frequency came out earlier than that using 2600 hertz or 2400, but 26 became the US standard. So a 2600 hertz tone indicated this line is on hook. So in the frequency division multiplex on those microwave networks, an idle channel was one indicated by a 2600 hertz tone, right? That had interest, interesting in-band properties and a certain, we know, a certain whistle of a certain serial happened to be that frequency. Also, pulse signaling was sent as 20 pulses or 10 in some cases, but on the toll network they could send 20 on the um, toll switches, 20 pulse per second, beep, 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 interruptions in that 2600 hertz tone. Actually, it wasn't interruptions, it was sending the on hook that was interrupted to go off hook and then send the dial pulses. But it's true that when the trunks were unused, they're all sending 2600 That's to right. each other, and if it fails, the 2600 goes away, then they can detect it and go fix it. That's right. That's right. You know, having a tone there was useful for maintenance purposes. So it was a good idea with one minor problem of uh, security. And so then they introduced common channel inner office signaling, which is sometimes called signaling system six. And this is signaling messages sent on 2400 hertz bit, 2400 bit per second data circuits, that's what the modem was on an analog channel, paralleling the trunks. But the signaling moved out of band so that you couldn't whistle your calls anymore. And that was, you know, uh, done for security reasons. In the 19... There that, that they went over to well, they were phased yeah. it out over the 70s and 80s, yeah. Then fiber optics replaced the microwave, okay? It really took over in the 80s. Their first use was earlier in the 70s, uh, the first deployments. But really, in the 1980s, mass production of fiber optics and the trunk networks went, f finished basically in the 1990s, going to fiber and leaving those AT&T microwave towers behind. Those are the horn antennas, they're sometimes called periscope antennas, that AT&T's microwave network use. And some of them might still be left on the towers. They weigh 3,000 pounds. Their FCC microwave rules do not allow them to be used anymore. They, I think they send too much power upwards because you point the klystron up and the periscope bends it forwards. Oh, so it's no longer, in use. no longer in use, no longer allowed. If, you, if, if, if there were some left in use from them, they'd be allowed, but they're not allowed. You can't build these dishes. Everything is a dish or you know, pretty much a dish nowadays. Um, but the big, the towers are still widely used. I mean, American Tower has bought up a bunch of those, right? They're cell towers. They're great towers. They're all over the place. Um, here's the business problem. Introducing fiber. The whole business model of the phone companies was based on scarcity. Long distance trunks were expensive and scarce. Now we have near infinite capacity. Just need more capacity on fiber, you add what are sometimes called optronics. 
you could add more lambdas, more light wave colors. So the actual cost of bandwidth fell to near zero, and the cost, not the price, the cost per call minute fell by more than 99%. But the telephone companies had a business model based on the scarcity of long distance, because in 1929 that was a luxury, and the whole industry was structured around that. So, been a problem. Another technology change, ISDN, Integrated Services Digital Networks, introduced in the 1980s, and the idea was to get rid of the analog protocols since the network was digital. Why shouldn't the interfaces be digital? So we had end-to-end -end digitization of the PSTN to the subscriber. The idea was, since it's computers at both ends, why do we have computers generating tones and decoding tones when they could just send the raw bits of what they meant? Totally logical, remove the vestiges of analog signaling. It happened in Japan, it happened in Europe, it did not happen in the US. A call on the network is of course a 64,000 bit per second channel because that's what T1 carrier needed. The PSTN is all about 64 kilobit channels. ISDN was 64 kilobit channels offered in raw bit form. You could carry voice, you could carry data as common carriage. This caught on, analog lines were largely digitized the backbone inner switch signaling was signaling system seven. That did catch on. That's in use today. That's a dedicated packet switch network for inner office signaling. It's also used for texting. Had the ability to send little 160 character messages. That's where texting came from. The American telephone companies, though, mostly hated ISDN. The one exception being Centrex lines. Centrex being central office emulating a PBX. Bell Atlantic was all about Centrex, so they would only do ISDN for Centrex. Most of the other companies still mostly liked it for Centrex. Why? Why didn't they want to do it? This is the 80s, dial-up data and that new internet thing. It was the 90s when it was actually in production, early 90s. The switches are ready, ISDN's phasing in just as the internet goes public. The, you know, the whole AUP issue on the internet backbone had been solved in 92. ISP started popping up like crazy. ISDN was a perfect fit, better than modems. Well, Bell saw that. They wanted to stop the internet, so they suppressed ISDN. They, instead, people used modems. They couldn't suppress the internet. They just made it work worse. And ISDN was still the PSTN of evolution. Since the 1990s, the technological development has been voice <coughs> over IP and voice using IP. Let me introduce that term if you're not familiar with VUP. Local competition opened in 1996, and that meant that all these new telephone companies were a market and new vendors. I counted in 2000, I was doing a project for a client who was opening a network, and they, you know, who are the switch vendors? I identified 12 new companies building central office switches, or at least trying to, some of them never got to market, and many of them failed. But everybody was trying to get into the act. Between 1997 and 2000, everyone was trying to get into the act of building central office switches. But they were mostly using IP. Not exclusively, but had IP interfaces. That's what Wall Street wanted. And I cannot find this, but there was once an, a, a lucent flyer that for IP attachment to the 5 ESS that carried IP from one cabinet to another where it was converted back to PCM, three feet of IP in the middle. And their justification, written down in another Wall Street image. They said you're using VoIP, that was sexy. Okay, voice over IP usually means voice over an existing IP network, like voice over the internet, vonages. Term, better term for that, I think, is parasitic VoIP. It provides a low-tier phone service over others. Others are paying for it. Others are providing the IP best efforts, scare quotes required service. Voice using IP, VUP, is managed. It's the IP network replaces TDM. What's IP? Internet protocol IP defines a multiplexing header. That's all that IP is. IP is not a protocol. IP is a multiplexing header. So instead of using time division multiplexing, you use IP packets to multiplex the physical medium, but not the internet. It's carried 
at high quality of service, reserved bandwidth, not intermixed with bursty data, unlike BESQR, best effort, square quotes required, IP. It's IP in name, but it's nothing like the IP of the internet. Packet cable, which is how cable companies carry telephone calls, is VUP, dedicated high quality service. I have a fax machine on packet cable, works great. Voice over LTE, which is being phased into the 4G mobile, is largely VUP. It's again, carefully managed IP. Fios and Uverse sometimes use IP for the voice service. Again, it's managed, it's not internet. So VUP is transparent to end users. It works just like TDM with a tiny bit more latency. Like it's, it's like 50 extra milliseconds of latency, but it works with modems and fax. So it's high quality service. Signaling system seven, which is a, my nickname for the protocol is the protocol from hell. If you ever try to actually look at the specification, it's giving way to SIP. SIP is the standard protocol nowadays, but it was based it was based on 1980s, well, SS7 was 1980s, but SIP looks like 1970s, ASCII headers, because whoever invented SIP, Henning Schulzerin, didn't know there was such a device as a protocol analyzer. And so they would, you know, look at the headers on a serial port because that's how people thought in those, you know, and this is done around 2000. So it's a backwards throwback in band text protocols but then it goes well with IP. IP is older than TDM. IP came out in 1974. IP version four, the only one that works, came out. Anyone know what year IP version four came out? 1978. That's the current and final real version of IP, is 1978. And the FCC thinks we're modernizing the network? Okay, let's look at what the FCC and state regulators have done they introduced something called price cap regulation. Instead of the rate of return system of utilities, in the rate of return, a telco was entitled to earn a profit margin on their rate base. And rate base was the underappreciated value of their plant. The more investment, the more profit. There was a risk of padding the rate base. They were gold plating, but oh yes, we'll spend $100,000 to feed these 10 houses bring a cable out 10 miles to the subdivision and sell them service for $8 a month because the $100,000 went on to the rate base and all their customers shared in the price. Monopoly profits in some areas ensured that it was profitable overall. But in the 90s, they saw that the cost was going down. Everything was getting cheaper to build. Computer switches were getting cheaper. So please free us from this rate of return limit. They were given price cap regulation. They could earn whatever profits they wanted as long as the price, the retail price of basic service and the wholesale price stayed under a cap, at least temporarily. There was therefore no rate base anymore and therefore no incentive to invest. And there's been almost no investment. And the plant is very deteriorated. If you, you know, the quality of the POTS lines in rural America where it's not profitable and even in some cities has gone way down. As far as depreciation, they've actually managed to exceed 100% depreciated, which is possible. I don't know how, but it is. In some places, they're between 95 and 100% depreciated, but very little investment. They've laid off staff right away. It's after, you know, in the 90s, huge layoffs. They're still, the telephone companies have a tiny fraction of the number of technicians they had 25 years ago. And that raises the profits levels, but less maintenance, long-term issues. The chickens are coming home to roost. The sunset of the PSTN is decay. It's caused by this malign neglect, not maintaining the network, milking the installed plant for all it's worth because you're rewarded by Wall Street for next quarter's profits, not what's left in your asset base 20 years from now. The assets have gone to zero. Telephone company accounting makes Tolkien look like nonfiction. It's that much of a fantasy. Personal telephones, of course, are now mobile. Wireline use among residential and personal users is in decline. Most young people only have mobile phones. Businesses, though, need wireline to receive the calls. The wireline network is very important. Wireless is mostly fiber except for the last mile. It's PSTN. 
Mobile calls get, residential, get preferential treatment. Bill and keep, no inner charge for intra-MTA. MTA, major transport area, 50 of the 50 areas in the country based on Rand McNally's commercial atlas. So greater New York up to New England, local call on mobile only. They abolish long distance charges, therefore, and so it was more competitive. Mobile's also more profitable. They upsell you to the data services, People value mobility, AT&T and Verizon push it instead of wireline. People are willing to pay more and pay for block of byte rates for mobile they wouldn't pay for on a wireline service. And mobile devices are sexy, right? But as, they're toys. But they suck for talking on. They have terrible voice quality for the most part. You've got generations who mostly text the kids now because they don't know what a phone call is supposed to sound like. They don't know what PSTN sounded good in the 90s. It's hard to buy a wireline phone. My office phone's a terrible piece of crap. You don't sell good wireline phones in the store. Magic pixie dust, IP in the network. The IP, because the internet's not regulated, it uses IP. Don't regulate us, we're IP. Oh, except now they regulate the internet because the network neutrality advocates didn't know what they were asking for. But the regulators don't regulate the telecom where they sprinkle this IP magic pixie dust into the PSTN. And IP is a multiplexing header. In the FCC's world, they don't know a transistor. Oh, well, the transistor radio is one thing. Everything with transistors is a transistor, right? No. IP is many things, like transistors. What's coming next? The FCC has an open docket called Sunset, or Tech Transition Technologies. IPs can use IP internally, uh, ILEX can use IPs internally. Well, they've been doing so. But now they're told they don't even have to be able to support fax or modems, alarm systems, any of these other non-voice applications after 2025. They wanted to get rid of it today. But they were, this is the FCC being pro-consumer, you must give us until 2025 to use the PSTN. Then the quality can go to hell in a Montana, handbasket, whatever. Line power no longer required on the phones. All they have to do is make it possible to put a battery in the device. If they buy it, they can make it hard. You can be hard to find it. As long as there's a possibility of battery powering it yourself, that's all the protection you need. And states that allow it, the ILEX are abandoning copper and telling users to go cellular, move to the voice link service. Just a little black box. And maybe the ancient long distance concepts will go away. Local number portability is coming. That a whole subsidy, cross subsidy is finally maybe nearing an end because people take their, there's a great XKCD about that. Local number portability is the rule. National portability is coming. And then, you know, they'll have to change the, go the way they do the initiating dip rather than terminating dip. You'll know the ILEX will find a way to squeeze competitors with this. So they always do. And the hackers will always remember the good old days. Thank you. I know time is tight. Any quick questions before uh, the next person comes up here? We have only about one minute. One minute, yeah. What's inside the enormous central office buildings that used to house all of the interface to your first fair? There's a D-slam on every corner now. Huh? Right. It's, it's a lot of empty space. It's just a big empty warehouse. They could be in the data, they, if they were smart, they'd go into the, you know, real estate business. They have. They've sold some off. In New York, they have. They have. I actually work for a large island. Yeah. And that's exactly what Yeah. It's data, data space. But they have many they aren't even using. Hmm? Two minutes left. Oh, 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 two minutes left. Any more questions? I knew I'd see you. Any more questions? Oh, is ISDN still being provisioned? No. I, well, actually, ISDN basic rate is no longer available. The retail 2B plus D lines. Uh, some of them are grandfathered, but they're no longer being made available. But primary rate caught on, and therefore the standard PBX trunk is primary rate, and that is still available. Okay. And the CLEX can provide that too. Sure. Acting housing is up next. We're going to have to get the next talk in here, but welcome to stand out. Okay. Yep. The yep. Let me just put myself Absolutely away. Absolutely no rush to leave. Oh, yeah. Other than no, maybe right here. Yep. Oh, no, I'm giving the space up to the next guy. Okay. Disconnect.